Hospital. Mm -hmm. Grew up on the west side. Mm -hmm. um, moved when I was really young. Moved when I was really young. I moved to Prince George's County, mm -hmm. Pretty Girl County. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, seven, <laughs> around seven, eight years old. So that's why I, that, that's where I was able to get the DC dialect mm -hmm. really down pat. Mm -hmm. I already had the Baltimore dialect. Mm -hmm. I ain't, I ain't thinking a million years I was going to use it right. uh, to, to do comedy, but mm -hmm. uh, went off to school. Uh, Coffin State University. Right, right, right. Uh, go Eagles. Go Eagles. Go Eagles. Uh, Coffin State University. Uh, that's where I met a lot of people from New York and Philly and mm -hmm. Jersey and mm -hmm. Atlanta and Chicago. And that, yeah. yeah. That's where you got some material from, basically. Huh? Yeah, the, internet, the social media shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My man, my man. So, basically, when you uh, see Baltimore Dudes, how. how how we holler? How Baltimore do you holler at chicks? How they holler at chicks? How y'all at? Man, it depends on which, which, what type of nigga it is. Right. Yeah. Fuck it is, dummy. <laughs> you said it's a whore, girl. <laughs> With your dumb ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? What about DC, what about DC dudes? Hey, she fat as a mug, yeah. <laughs> you see Slim? Yeah, what about shorty going. What about Chicago? Chicago? Man, so how Chicago be like when they talk to the chicks? Hey, I ain't no Lane. I ain't no Buford. I ain't no goofy ass nigga. But I instantly need your number on God. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you, you basically working out of... Uh, Maryland, the D.C. region, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You're trying to work your way into Baltimore, man. Holla at my man, Alaria Zomar. He at SNS Lounge every Thursday with DJ Dave Charles. Yep. Right, so what you working on? What you got coming up next? Man, right now, see, I, 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 I'm low-key, man. Right. I'm not really a flashy dude. I'm a real humble guy. Mm -hmm. um, I listen and read a lot. That's why, you know, I'm a mm -hmm. great comedian because mm -hmm. I'm able to visualize what I'm thinking mm -hmm. and what you might be thinking of what might relate to you. Mm. And I, I kind of like try to envision, if I was listening to a person, what would I want to hear them say? Right. What would tickle my fancy, mm. you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, uh, what was the question again? I'm high. <laughs> 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 okay. You made you want to get into the comedy lane, period. 
Oh man, I've been a dumbass nigga all my life, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, I was in school, um, really for no reason. Mm. Um, right. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. A lot of a lot of black a lot of, a lot of black people, you know, raise their children. Mm. Go to college. Mm. But you ain't tell me why. Right. You ain't tell me for what. Mm. You know, what, why why am I going to school? Mm. Just you know, and then and I'ma say this on record. Mm. If you want to go and get an education, there's nothing wrong with that. But make sure you specialize in something that guarantees the bag. Right. <laughs> okay? The bag. Nursing, being an attorney, law enforcement, mm -hmm. things that guarantee um, a job opportunity, getting the IT, things mm -hmm. of that nature. But if you go into school and you majoring in criminal justice, but you hate the police, right. you know you can't do shit like that. That don't mix. Right. Um, if you go into school to be a physical education teacher, mm. um, I mean, you won't be wearing uh, you for your 400 pounds. You won't be wearing Air Maxes, I'll tell you that. Right, right. Yeah, right. you know, it's crazy that you see all these people going and getting these degrees, man, and then they work behind the desk at CVS and oh. shit like that, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't go together. So now, you know, we got to think smarter before we act, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of people used to put their kids out, men at 18 years old, remember that? Mm -hmm. When you're 18, you get the fuck out of here. Nobody 18 ready for life. Right. You know what I mean? Majority, anyway. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a more serious tip. But bring back the help to the fun <laughs> shit. Yeah. Bring back the, I like to educate when I talk. You right, know that's, right. That's, how, that's how I go. That's how I go. So, far as, uh, where you get where you get most of your material from, though, when you, you sit down and write? Which, which one? My family's funny as shit. Right. I'm not even the funniest person in my family. Right. I just, I just had the most heart. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Go out and do it. Um, I say a lot is family. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is struggle. Mm -hmm. You know that we all, you know, we all face. Right. Um, just being a dickhead. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I gotta throw that in there. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, watching Martin mm -hmm. and growing up. Ooh, ooh, wrong in the house. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, Eddie Murphy, he was dope. Coming mm -hmm. to America. Uh, Mike Epps, Dave Chappelle. Mm -hmm. You know, I watch those guys. And then I say, like, and this is one thing I'm gonna address when it comes to comedians, especially nowadays. Mm -hmm. Everybody think when you cursing, you funny. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know, when I talk to older vet veteran comics in the game, we we look at them as mumble comedians, mm -hmm. just like mumble rappers. You mumble rappers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? People that they think they funny, but you're not showing the crowd how smart you are, mm -hmm. how you know. Um, Intuitive, your mind is, you right. know what I mean? I like to make people say, what the fuck made him think of that right, shit? Right. You know what I mean? I like that, you know? Mm. Um, I like to blow people's mind away, you know? See, a lot of y'all comedians now, y'all, there's almost some battling going on. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that, that's due to, you know, opportunities. Mm. You know, they limited to none, you feel like, like for me, I love everybody that's really out here doing it and doing it the way it's supposed to be done. Right. You know, I feel as though I'm I feel as though I'm talented mm -hmm. to the point where I don't have hate in my body for nobody out right. there doing this thing. Mm -hmm. Um cuz I'm I feel like I'm not gifted, you know what I mean? So I don't look at anybody as a threat. My 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 biggest competition is myself. Right. You know, um so for me I like roasting motherfuckers mm -hmm. to death. Do us part. You I know see, what I'm saying? I seen, I seen you went at a very popular person. Uh, I don't know if you got a response. He's very popular here in Baltimore. What's her name? Her yeah. name is Jess Alarius. You, you went at Jess? You went at Jess. Yeah, you went at Jess. Yeah, I went at Jess. We don't know if we can smoke response. That's that, 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 that was propaganda, man. Right. Uh, me and Jess are real cool. Right. Um, I think she's a young girl more than anything. Um, I love her grind. Right. You know what I mean? She grind, and I don't know anybody that had the strategy that she had to right. propel herself the way she did. Mm -hmm. That's what I respect about her the most. Right. She, she, you can see that she trying to provide for her son through mm -hmm. her fucking shit that she right. did. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I, re I really dig that. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know. She did respond though. Did she? Yeah. What she said? She was like, you funny as a bitch, but uh, I ain't responding to you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I, was, <laughs> I was like, damn, just show me some love. You know a nigga need my father was baby. Don't do me like that. And it it, it kinda sucked because it's like, you know, we in this thing together, you know, we, we struggling some of us are struggling as comedians, you right. know. I've been doing stand up eight years, so I'm way more experienced than your typical internet comedian. Right. I've been I've been doing the stage thing for quite some time, almost a decade. So when it comes to actual live performance, when people see me, they're like, Oh my god, why aren't you on tour with Kevin Hart or X, right. Y, and Z? Mm. With these other people, with the younger because I'm I'm twenty nine. Mm. Um, a lot of these other internet cats you know, 23, 24 years old, still living at home with their parents. They got all the time of the day in the world to create this facade or persona. Mm. I got a motherfucking kid raised. Right. Um, and a nine to five, and a girl that I gotta please and give her that, that them deal pickles. Uh, <laughs> every now and then, you know, so it's a lot going on and managing my comedy and my own independent career. So, um, where a lot of people have all the time in the world to be on videos, like I gotta really manage my shit. You know, I can't be out here cheating no more and shit right. like that. Um, <laughs> I really gotta get it together, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, nah, man. What, what, what's interesting about the whole comedy thing, man, is just seeing the many different styles. Mm. Like I lived, I still where I started. At. I started in school. Mm. wasn't no competition. Didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Mm. I honest, I'm not. Never mind. I'm not gonna say what I was gonna say. Mm. Um, <coughs> when I started in school, all right, I I tell you, I got chased out of my school. Mm. Uh, my second comic, my second time being on that school, and they had um, a talent showcase for the students, and I said, you know, I had to, I, I had quit playing basketball, mm. and uh, for two weeks I've been watching comedy. I said, I'm gonna do this shit. Right? Mm -hmm. So I started watching Bill Bellamy's Who's Got Jokes, right? Mm -hmm. They had uh, Lil Rail at the time. He was, a, you know, nobody knew him. Kid from Chicago. And I'm watching all these different people. And I'm watching, and I'm like, yo, they saying some of the most basic shit you can right. say. Because, mm -hmm. you know, on television, you got to be clean. Right. You know, you can't be all raunchy and just talk about anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they breaking down some of the most simplest things and these people are laughing hysterically. Careers are being made right now. Right. So I wrote for like two weeks, man. Um, I was studying for an exam and I was walking through the auditorium and uh, to get to the library and they had a talent showcase. Mm. And my boy was like, yo, you gonna do the talent showcase? I was like, it's today. Mm. So I ran back to my dorm room, changed my fucking clothes and went back in there and I was like, hey, is it too late to sign up? White guy was like, sure. Mm. Uh, there's always more space. There's always more room for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then he put me on stage, man. And I go up there, and I'm doing first time ever on stage, first time ever touching the mic. And I mean, I'm killing them from beginning to end. I mm -hmm. did about five minutes. And for, when you first started out, three minutes is a long, two minutes is a long time. Right. Did five minutes, man, laughing hysterically. And I was like, there's a prize? I was like, yeah, the winner gets $500. What's that, five? And uh, they went, they called up third place, they called up second place, then they called up first place. And uh, I didn't get anything. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get nothing. You know, no, no, no. Yeah, had my high, high hopes, right. but uh, I didn't know the rules. You couldn't curse. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't curse. So I was like, damn, man, it's cool. At least I did it. Right. You know, um, that same week, Kevin Hart was coming to our school. Now, the whole school found out that I'm doing comedy. Right? You know, I, I was a ball player, so everybody knew who I was. Oh, this motherfucker's funny as shit. He's doing comedy now? Black Student Union is throwing a talent showcase within the same week. Mm -hmm. The person that wins this uh, showcase gets to open up for Kevin Hart. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at this like a motherfucking kid in the candy store, like, yo, I'm about to be open up for Kevin Hart because ain't nobody more talented than me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go out here and prove it. So the whole week, you talking about this happened on a Tuesday. The contest for the Black Student Union is on Friday. Mm. Okay, so the whole week, motherfuckers coming up to my my, my room. Yo, I see you this Friday. Mm. I see you at the Black Student Union, man. I heard you was funny as shit. All that. Now I'm like, yo, I can't do this. Shit. Mm. I ain't that good. Dang. And then they recorded. They recorded me earlier that week. 
So I'm like, these black kids, I can't do the same shit again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't got enough time to make up new material. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna get drunk. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get drunk, get that liquid courage, and be Uncle Charlie at the cookout. Right. Right? Man, I go up there, I'm twisted. I drunk two forties or two eleven. Dang. The fuck? I'm <laughs> nigga, I'm punished. Man, I get up there. They had this thing that came out called the tweaker list, right? Mm. The tweaker list was basically a list that they published on Facebook. All the girls on school that was home, mm. right? On campus. Mm. So I ain't had no material, so I say. Tweaker list. I got a tweaker list. <laughs> so these are real girls, real students. That was just who, I, I'm sorry, I'm taking this interview somewhere else. I'm telling I'm, this story time with hilarious Omar right there. <laughs> Man, I got on that stage and I'll never forget. I was so nervous. You're talking about over 500 people. And I got on stage and I said, What's up, Millersville? How y'all feeling? I said, A couple days ago, we all know what happened. A tweaker list came out. Mm. <laughs> Some of y'all in here right now don't make me punch you out. Mm. <laughs> I said, coming in the dick sucking champion of the world, second Dang. place. <laughs> Give it up for you. And I said the girl's name. Damn. Whole crowd was like, oh. <laughs> you talking about people on top of tables like, oh, oh. The, the president of the student union is like, oh, no, no, no. I'm drunk. Right. I can't stop it. No, I'm, I'm like a shark. What's her name, though? I see blood. What's her name? <laughs> What's her name? Who was that? I take back to the And I was like, champion, give it up. And I say her name. Mm. I was like, when you open up that pack of Starburst and your favorite flavor is tropical oh. dick, I'm just saying. Dang. Right? Man, the, the uh, president came up there, cut the mic, kicked me off stage. Before they cut the mic off, I started going on him. You fat, black, back of the neck ass nigga. You, I'm just going in, everybody going crazy though. Mind you, I didn't crush these girls' heart in the front. Because they knew me, you know what I mean? And I'm just trying to be as funny as I possibly can. Now realizing this shit is personal now. Man, I get off that stage, the whole, you talk, like I said, it's like 500 students in there. Whole crowd mobbed out after me. Bitches squaring up with me and all that. I'm like, all of this overcome? Right. You bitches need to relax. Okay, y'all about to get expelled for this. So, uh. You're in a position to fight. You I'm not in a position smooth. to fight, man. And my, my girl, my, man, this was like Bonnie and Clyde, right? So, we was getting them student loans, right? So, my girl, we had just got, this is when the Lincoln LS was hot. Everybody wanted the Lincoln LS. Y'all remember that? Yeah, yeah. We got that motherfucker painted candy paint red. So she pull up when they open the back door. She pull up behind. I was like, "Bitch, stop it!" I was like, "I was like, baby, they gonna fuck up the paint. Take that to the, take it to the, to where we stay at." Cause I had a little spot off campus too, man. I was getting it back then, man. I had my little weed set up and everything. Uh, damn, I remember those motherfuckers. Uh, but yeah, man. Um, Man, mm -hmm. crowd let out, man. They put a big ass poster up during the Kevin Hart show. Mm. This student is banned and has no entry uh, admission to this show. <laughs> Damn. Never lost. Never ever. Damn. Yeah, man. So, I'm way past that point, man. Right. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I've been saying you, you, you've been grinding. Your, your followers is up real heavy. Yeah, man. You know over, over. You talking about over 155,000? On Facebook, like thirty-five thousand on Instagram. Damn. In the course of like, for real, for real, over the course of like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's amazing. You know, all my stuff. It ain't no propaganda. You know, I gotta be straight funny, mm -hmm. and I'm already dealing with the fact that you know. Yeah, you bottle. Shout you out to Dave Butler. Oh, man, right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, man, like I say, like, when I came to your show last time, I told you, man, I said, man, I ain't sure, you, you funny. Thank so you, So you got some real substance, boy. You, you going, you, you feel me? Yeah. So with a lot of these dudes with this uh, internet, it ain't necessarily funny and over-filtering the, uh, the game, if that's a you word. You said dude, dude, dudes with the internet? I mean, that just heard it, you know what I mean? Man, it's, it's kind of fucking it up a little bit. It's fucking it up simply because everybody thinks they can do it. Right. Everybody think because they got this mm. right here and they can create a persona real fast. That dude, that dude that's on Nick Cannon, ah, 
something? DC Young Fly? He not funny. I can say it because I ain't no Yeah, you're not a comedian. I'm going I'm to say this. I'm going to say this. I remember when DC Young Fly first got first started with stand up. Right. It wasn't that great because, you know, it's a craft. You got to oh. build it. You got to get it improved majorly. And, I, you know, like I said, I don't hate, you know, right. in that. that I don't want to say too much. If, if, I, I, if, I, ain't think, if I ain't think it was funny, okay. I would just say, you know, it's not my cup of tea. But I got to give the boys props. He definitely yeah. elevated his, um, his craft from what he used to be. I think he's real funny, but. <laughs> Crack on that guy, my cousin Swole, that's gonna get out on you real bad. Yo, that, that fuck you mean he do? Mm, fuck you mean. That that took him a long way. I never knew it could be that simple. Fuck you mean. That's all he's saying. Fuck you mean. Yeah, yeah. 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 another yeah. hundred thousand shit. It was just like that. I was wondering when he said, what the fuck you mean? Get out of Yeah, man. Well, um, where can people catch you? How can they follow you? And um, what's next and everything else? So what's next is I got a, you know, a lot of, like I said, I'm low key. Mm. Um, I've been studying a lot of acting. Mm. You know, I get I get hundreds and thousands of messages a day. Mm. And for real, for real, I look at all of them. Mm. You know, when I go out and I see people randomly, you know, it, it still surprises me. I know I oversaturated the area, but it still surprises me mm. when people come up to me randomly, little kids, hey, can I get your order, man? Mm. And I do it like it's nothing, but in my mind, I'm like, this motherfucker want my autograph, right. me? Mm. Grown men missing teeth. Boy, oh, you so here funny, boy, goddamn, boy. You know, right. it, it, it's a feeling that, it's a feeling that, um, you know, I'm still in La La Land, like, mm. you know, it's crazy, it's cool. But at the end of the day, before you get off, because I know you not only funny, but you're a political dude. The dude that got shot in his backyard, man, speaking of it, man. Where was that? Sacramento. Sacramento, Sacramento California. California. It was 22 times? Yeah. I thought it was 20. It's 20. It's 20. It was 20? Shit. It was two different. Right. A murder is a murder. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Murder, yeah, right. Um, right. Right. Man, when I really think about it, you know, it's scary because, and I was having a conversation with a white dude. I, I trip white people out, Because I'm so smart. I put right. that shit on them and make them feel like, uh, Dundalk, you know what I'm saying? I make them feel real trashy. <laughs> um, so, uh, how I feel about that situation, man, you know, we've been dealing with this for a minute, and it's crazy in 2018 that we're still dealing with so much, um, so many things that have to do with civil rights. Right. And uh, how I feel, you know, law enforcement in general is corrupt. Mm. You know, it wasn't designed to protect us. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, and a lot of a lot of law enforcement agencies around the country still cater to that uh, prehistoric value mm. that they set way back when, mm. um, and not being held accountable. Uh, I think that I think that a lot of what we're experiencing in this country has to do with supremacy and the fact of a, a community of people. Although you know what what, what uh, white people do, mm. this is what they do. There might be a group of racists over here, supremacists, believers, or Donald Trump supporters mm. over here. Then there's, you know, other white people that don't represent them. Mm. But what they don't do is speak out against what right. they're doing. Right. 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 They don't. They don't speak out against the bad and the wrong that's happening. Mm. So what it, what it does is, if you aren't if you aren't um, speaking speaking against it. Right. You're basically saying you're with it. Right. That's what happens mm -hmm. in, in the simplest form. So the only way to really to really change it, unfortunately, we're outnumbered in this country. Mm. So white people, honestly, I, this is how I feel. I could be wrong, but I feel like it would take for white people, just like how they support LBGTQ mm. and all these different groups, it would take for them to really band with us, mm. as well as the Latinos, mm. to say, Yo, this ain't cool. Mm. This is fucked up, and we need to do something about it. You know what I mean? Until then, um, you know, music is a big aspect of why we fucked up. Mm. Like people listen to Moneybag Yo and Migos and all of that. Mm. They don't have a problem paying two niggas two million dollars, five million dollars a year mm. to promote music and, and pump that into the youth. Mm. And now these, instead of they, them wanting to be, these kids coming up, instead of them wanting to be doctors or lawyers or whatever, they think they're about to be a rapper when they when they finish school, if they finish high school. Mm. 
You know what I mean? They think that they about to go do that. No, you're not. Right. I'm gonna keep paying these couple mm. while y'all while y'all sit here and dream and think Smart that. You know what I mean? Why y'all why y'all live by the culture per right. se? You know. Mm. Um, and that's not the culture at all. And um, a lot of people don't understand that. But you know, I'm trying to. I'm really trying to use my comedy career to propel me into the advocacy role. Okay. You know, you gotta you gotta you gotta build one mountain first. Mm. And, and how I feel, you you start with that brick. And eventually you'll have a wall. So, you know, it's, it's all a process. Right. You know. Right. Um, but, yeah, you guys can find me uh, on IG at Hilarious Omar. Facebook, same thing, Hilarious Omar fan page. Check me out. Uh, I got a lot of funny projects on the way. Um, Big Guy, Little Guy's coming soon. That's a project that I'm working with this dude named Big Terry. He's going to act as my security guard. And uh, if y'all have ever seen Martin, uh, I actually got the concept from Martin with uh, Super uh, Dragonfly Dragon Jones yeah. and the, the, the uh, when he was the sensei mm. uh, mentoring the guy that used to whoop his ass. Mm. <laughs> so basically I'm gonna be ego tripping mm. with this big motherfucker and then he always gonna humble me you right. know, on the video. So that's coming soon, that's a new project. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, you can catch me every Friday at Funny Fridays um, in Fort Washington, Maryland at Martini's. Funny as hell, every week we got a national headliner that comes in every week. Um, that I fly in. Um, SNS Lounge, unfortunately, Baltimore. I had to pack up my things and, you know, kind of stop SNS. We're going, we're going to pick it back up, but right now we're just taking a hiatus at the moment. The hilarious Omar and Friends comedy show. All right, y'all. Everybody, give it up for the Larry's Omar. Yeah. We here in the man cave. We got leaders of a beautiful struggle. We got uh, Dave All Love, director of the public policy, and CEO Adam Jackson. How you feel, bro? Good, good. How you feel? Oh man, welcome to the man cave. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Oh man, we need leaders out here in the city today. So, leaders of a beautiful struggle. Um, so, what is your organization about? What are y'all trying to achieve? So we're a grassroots think tank that advocates specifically for the interests of black people. Right. So one of the things that uh, make Adam and I unique is we actually participated in policy debate. So it's usually it's one of those activities where a lot of people that come out of it mm -hmm. end up being in a political arena. Not right. even just politicians, but they end up like really working behind the scenes. Okay. And so when we finished with debate, we looked around in Baltimore and said a lot of the people that was advocating on issues that impacted our community weren't people of and from our community. Right. So that's why we built the Of A Beautiful Struggle. And so we've been tackling issues like criminal justice, you know, mass incarceration, you know, police brutality. Right. So those are like the major issues that, you know, we work on. So how long y'all organization been established and when did y'all start? And so we founded it in 2010. Mm -hmm. So it's been eight years since okay. we started. And so one of the, actually the first things we worked on, uh, Maryland was going to build a $104 million juvenile detention facility for mm -hmm. youth charged as adults. Right. And so if you think about a 180 bed facility, and at the time, the juvenile system wasn't even all the way full. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they build more beds, they're going to try to fill it. Right. So a big part of our push was to get them to not build it so that they had to have alternatives to incarceration, make it so that people um, got some kind of like community-based kind of, you know, community-based program instead of putting them in jail. Right, right, right. So you're the director of public, public policy. policy. Public policy. Yeah. So most of my work is actually directly interact with elected officials, politicians. So I spend a lot of time in Annapolis, City Hall. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm the one that go actually interface with them. Okay. And you're the CEO. Mm -hmm. So yep. you you created this monster. Well, we we co-founded it. I handle co -founded. Yeah, I handle the money, the administration, and making sure the day-to-day -day operations gets handled. Okay. Okay. So what is your what did you do? What did you bring to the table. I mean, my job is to raise money. Right. So, and I, one of the things that we had talked about early on, we found in LBS, mm -hmm. uh, it was important to us as a political organization mm -hmm. that we were financially independent mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of black people, what happens is we create nonprofits to do advocacy work, mm -hmm. and then you become uh, beholden to some of these white organizations that pay your salary, basically. Like, you the, one of the things that I talked about earlier, the youth jail. So, right. it was interesting because when we first started fighting against the jail, Everybody was telling us, you know, it was going to get built. Right. Um, so we were really glad to see that we were successful in stopping that from being built. Mm -hmm. um, so that was 2013. Um, one of our latest things we're working on, so one of the things we talk a lot about is the nonprofit industrial complex. Mm -hmm. 
So you have a lot of people that's making money off the suffering of black people. Right. And I think a lot of times people don't recognize that like it's a lot of money um, in servicing poor black kids. But the problem is the people that's getting money off of that is not our folks. Mm. It's, you know, it's, it's white people that come into our communities making money off of it or like these black gatekeepers, mm. you know what I mean, who will say enough to make them look like, you know, they for the community, but really don't work in the interests of our community. And so one of the things that we were involved in was the Baltimore City Youth Fund. So Baltimore City in 2016 created this $12 million fund. So $12 million a year is dedicated money for youth and children. Mm. And so Adam was actually, he was the co-chair of the task force appointed by the city council president to decide where that money goes. Right. And so we're actually in the process now of structuring that fund in such a way where it make, we make, we trying to make sure that it gets into the hands of organizations that really are in the community. Because right. traditionally you get those kind of big box corporate nonprofits that suck up all the money. Mm -hmm. um, but we've worked on is making sure that that $12 million, it's $12 million a year, mm -hmm. per year, every year, we're going to make sure that that money actually gets into the hands of people that know our community and really care about our community. Right. But I seen something when you was on uh, the show with Roland Martin, when you were saying that like black people were so comfortable being uh, going to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Democratic Party is just like, we know we got the black vote. Mm -hmm. So what do you think we should be independent or? So so here's, I'm glad you asked that question because so a lot of people don't recognize so so Maryland as a state mm -hmm. and Baltimore as a city is a Democratic Party stronghold. Right. So what that means so if you ever like go to like a voter registration right mm -hmm. they're gonna tell you register as a Democrat mm -hmm. and the reason they're gonna tell you register as a Democrat is because the Democrats is so over, this city is so overwhelmingly Democrat mm -hmm. that if you're not a Democrat you can't vote. Right. You know what I'm saying? Your vote don't matter if you're a Republican or anything else. Right. So, like, we're registered Democrats because mm. that's just the way it's set up. It's set up that the Democratic primary is the only thing that matters. Right. So, the reason why that's important is because there's a whole system in place mm. that make it so that people get to pick who's in leadership. Mm. So, a lot of the people that's in elected office were hand-picked years ago. And they were hand-picked by white corporate interests, right. right, that, again, don't really have an interest in our community. Right. And part of the problem is, is that we got a lot of black elected officials um, who are good at showing up to church before Election Day. They're good at showing up to the cookouts and stuff like that. But when it comes to really pushing against the power structure in Annapolis mm -hmm. or in City Hall, they don't really show up. Right. And so the point that I was making in that clip you saw is, is that like we got to start building our own independent power base politically right. and right. putting our money behind it. Mm. You know what I mean? Because the people in the opposition, they're funding candidates that are hurting our people. Let me, and let me give you a real specific example. One of our biggest successes last session, we fought the bail bonds industry. Mm. So between 2011 and 2016, the bail bonds industry made $265 million right, in the state of Maryland. Right. $75 million just off of people who never were convicted of anything. Right. So you're talking about millions and millions of dollars that the bail bonds industry was taking home. And if you think about bail, like, you just charged, mm -hmm. right? You haven't, you haven't been convicted, right. right? And if you're not a danger to the community, then you should be let out without having to pay nothing. Right. But the bail bonds industry was making a lot of money. So we actually were involved in the effort to change it. So that judges actually have to make sure that then when when they give you a bail, it's a bail that you can afford right. if they should give you one at all. Mm. The bail bonds industry paid for a dinner um, in Annapolis at Ruth's Chris, mm. where they brought together the black elected officials, right? Gave them free dinner, um, and what they did was they pretty much sold them their version. They were basically saying you need to keep bail, cash bail in place. Right. Um, and so we had to fight the black legislators. We had mm. to fight Baltimore City legislators who were being wind and dine. Now luckily, just because of the work we do in our organization and the reach we have with the community, we was able to kind of put them on blast. Mm. And so we was able to be successful in beating the bail industry. Right. But that's what I mean, like we gotta build more like, and, and because like Adam said, we're an independent organization. Right. So ain't no phone call nobody can make mm. to say, oh, they're getting too out of hand, you need to pull it. Like nobody can make that phone call. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it allowed us to be able to do that the way we did it. Okay. I got one more question for us. This can go to either one of you guys. If anything can go into effect today, it's law. What would y'all change in our community right now and, and go into effect and make a, a, a various change in our community? What would y'all do? What would the main thing y'all would do? Get more money to black people. 
because right. I think that's the biggest issue. One of the biggest problems that we find is not the lack of expertise mm. or lack of hard work in terms of what black people do in Baltimore. Mm. And I feel like the lie we tell ourselves that black people don't never have nothing, we don't do nothing in our community. Right. But the reality is if we just had more money, power, and resources to execute what we're already doing, right. then we'd be able to have a bigger impact in a city like Baltimore. Right. But I feel like because we have lack of access, that's why we don't, that's why we're not as effective. Right. And if you just look at it generationally, if you look at racism in an American context, we just haven't had access to that amount of money like white folks have for right. generations since slavery. And so from my perspective, if you have more money, more power, more access, particularly money, I think that we just need more resources to actually execute what we already have. Because I feel like we have brilliance that's already embedded in our community in the first place. Right. And the more we focus on that, instead of looking to outside, uh, outsiders and people that aren't from Baltimore mm. to put programming in, our, in, the, in the heads of our children or to make sure that we have access to health care, healthy food, like we should just look in our own community and look at that brilliance and invest in it as opposed to looking for other people to do it. Right. Agree with that? I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I appreciate that, man. Look, leaders of a beautiful struggle. There's guys out here, man, that's doing positive things in our community. We need to get behind them, support them. Appreciate you, brothers. Yeah, I appreciate the invitation. Man.